What's mother fucking good? Hey, listen. Yes, I'm wearing overalls. I got a reason. Reason number one, overalls bite. So bike. Get them now before they're played out. Big Dogs don't only tell you about the early trends in fantasy football. We tell you about... Yes, that song is from Coco. I'm gonna turn that shit off real quick. Anyways, we bike just like overalls is bike. Like I was saying, we don't just give you the earliest trends of fantasy football. We give you the earliest life trends. No, there's a reason why I'm wearing these. I'm attending a party next Saturday. Actually, if you're watching this, it's Monday. And I'm attending the party this Saturday. Theme of the party is smoking meats and clapping cheeks. It's cheek clapping season, guys. If you're unaware, y'all can figure out what that means. Smoking meats. So we're going to be smoking a lot of meat. My friend's having a party. Smoking meat. And his dress attire is overalls. If you're over 200 pounds, overalls are optional. I respect that party attire. This is my threads for the party. I just got them shipped to me. So I was just trying them on and I was like, you know what? Let me ball out for the next video. These things are a little small. They're a little tight on my uh, up my arse. My friend said I look like a fit hipster version of Lenny. I don't know what he meant by Lenny, but I think he meant the guy from Of Mice and Men. If anyone wants to clarify that for me, that'd be cool. Anyways, I'm feeling good today. We got the overalls. I just got my hair did. I was listening to a podcast today and Gary V was talking about like, why is everything so fucking negative on social media? Why does everybody always just want to come Complain. Why can't we just tweet out and be like, I feel good today. I feel like I'm having a great day. And that's how I'm feeling today. So I wanted to start this episode off in a good mood. Starting your week off right. Guys, keep your head up this week. Grind it this week. And then we can have a good weekend, right? That's what we're trying to do. You got to put in the work if you want to play later. It's the whole philosophy of big dogs got to eat fantasy football. But anyways, I just rambled on for about three minutes about clapping cheeks and whatnot. Today's in the muck Monday. Y'all know how we do it here in the muck Monday. We're comparing two players, two wide receivers on the same team. That would be Detroit Lions' Golden Tate and Marvin Jones. The only duo of wide receivers in 20 2017 to top 1,000 receiving yards. Now they're being picked around the same area, so I thought it was worth breaking down which of the two you should pick, because you're going to have to choose. If you want one of them, you're going to have to choose between the two of them. You ain't getting both of them. As we always do, we're going to get granular, we're going to get in-depth, we're going to break down who you should pick, why you should pick them, how they did last year, and what we think they're going to do this year. That's really all I got for you, so, so stay tuned, and let's get it. Break these numbers down like a tractor. We're gonna dive into the numbers, and as we always do, we start off with their average draft position, see where they're getting picked, because if they're not getting picked close to each other, what's the point of doing this, right? You're gonna have to choose between one or the other. Golden Tate right now is getting picked around 53 overall, wide receiver 22. Marvin Jones, five spots behind him, 58 overall, wide receiver 24. Now we're gonna we're gonna kind of break down Tate first, and then look at Jones. An easier one for me to analyze, just because they're both on the same team, so I can kind of break down the team aspect of everything together. Now when we look at Tate, right? Right? People kind of peg him as the king of consistency at a wide receiver, especially for like PPR leagues, right? He's got, sorry, these things are fucking riding up my nuts. He's had 90 catches in four straight seasons. So since coming over to Detroit, he's caught 90 passes four straight times. He's gone over a thousand receiving yards in three of four games. Let me max maximize my notes a little bit right quick. Um, he's gone over 1,000 receiving yards in three or four games. He's averaged 1,056 receiving yards in those for seasons. What I'm here to say is I don't think it's all gravy with Tate, however. Those numbers from the outside point of view look pretty good. Um, but as you know, he's never been a touchdown guy, right? In those four seasons, he's never eclipsed six touchdowns. He's only scored six touchdowns once. Uh, he scored five touchdowns last year. And the other two seasons were four touchdown totals. So four, four, five, and six. Those are his touchdown totals. Despite catching 90 plus passes, seeing 120 plus targets in all four seasons, and going over 1,000 yards in three of four seasons. So you're not getting basically any scoring upside here. He will be turning 30 in August, which I don't really hold against him because a lot of the slot receivers can play well into their 30s. Uh, that's why you see guys like Fitz get put into the slot because it's easier for them. They don't have to create as much separation. They don't need to be as agile and have as much burst, but I'm not really worried about that with Tate. I didn't see anything like fall off in terms of game film from last year into this year. Um, he is their primary slot receiver, of course. He ran 79% of his routes from the slot in 2017. And uh, he, he had 120 targets last year, and that was his lowest total of the four seasons by almost 10 full targets. Um, and was actually a 15 target drop off from 2016 to 2017. We saw his target market share also, which is more of a teller in terms of the involvement in the offense. We saw his target market share drop off from 23% of the Lions targets down to 21% in 2017. So year over year, he's getting a little bit less involved in this offense. Now Tate finished as wide receiver 15 on the year overall, but he was wide receiver 19 when you look at fantasy points per game. And that's what I like to look at because that's a sign of, uh, of efficiency, right? There's always that that kind of 
notion that Philip Rivers and Demarius Thomas and these guys are always so good, uh, such good fantasy options because they always finish up top, but their points per game numbers are not good. So when you're having to pick them high based on what their overall finish was, because they play, you know, Tate, I don't think Tate's missed a game since he's been in Detroit. Obviously, his overall numbers are going to be high because other players miss games, but on a points per game basis, he's usually a little bit lower. That's why we saw him finish as wide receiver nine, um, and that was among receivers last year that played in 12 games or more. So it is the entire sample size. I'm not taking guys who played in like one game and had 19 points per game or something like that. So um, I don't have to state the obvious that he's a better PPR play, but his his inconsistency in these yardage holes is what really, 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 really scares me. And this is something that we've seen with Tate from a production standpoint, year over year, over year, over year. Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, Golden Tate, do you do this to us fantasy owners? I was looking back and a crazy stat that I that I found that I tweeted and I think I put it on my Instagram post was that there were, um, was it five games last year? There were five games last year, right? Tate played in 16 games. There were five games last year in which Tate saw six targets or fewer. Now, six is not like a bad number. You could do some, some, some good production off six targets. There were five games last year where Tate saw six targets or fewer. In all five of those games, he never passed 33 receiving yards. The highest total in those five games was 33 receiving yards. He did not score in any of those games. That's something we keep seeing. In 2016, so you're looking at five absolutely dud games. Games with 33 or less receiving yards and zero touchdowns. He finished with 58 or less receiving yards in eight of 16 games, so half of his games. And he did that in 2016 as well. That number was actually nine instead of eight. And I actually just looked when I was writing this piece, I found another stat. You know, I, I found the six or fewer target stat. And then I wanted to see like how far back that goes if that was just an outlier every year. And I looked back over the last three seasons. Over the last three seasons, Tate has seen six or fewer targets in 17 games, including one playoff game. He has never eclipsed 60 receiving yards in a game where he has seen six or fewer targets. That's an 18-game sample going back three years. Never eclipsed 60 yards. So if he's not getting the volume, he's not getting the yardage. And that's what scares me about Tate. He's an inconsistent player, although at the end of the year, he has those games that get his stats up there. So that scares me, right? And I want to actually pull this up from, th this is from Pro Football Focus, a guy named Michael Moore. I don't think there's any relation to the killer. I could be wrong. You never know. Yesterday was Friday the 13th. So I'm filming this on Saturday. It's coming out Wednesday. Yesterday was Friday the 13th. So maybe it was a coincidence. God's plan was to put this guy into my article to get him some fame and fortune on Friday the 13th. Shouts out the fantasy gods for that one. We looked at his article called Player Showdown, Golden Tate or Marvin Jones, and he wrote earlier this year. And this is the only stat I think I pulled from this article, but I wanted to read this stat out loud. Tate saw an anemic 6.7 yard A dot, so average depth of target last season. 6.7 yards, which was 116th out of 120 qualified receivers. And that's, you know, we get that a lot from slot receivers because obviously their routes are, are sh more shallow, but um, going on, 116th out of 120 qualifiers. Think about that for a second. Every target Tate saw was almost 10 yards less than what Jones saw. So before a catch is even made, Jones has a one fantasy point advantage because he's getting 10 yards more on his targets. That was per that because uh, Jones's A dot was like 16. That was a crazy stat. I thought I'd give it to you. It might make more sense once I kind of dive into Marvin Jones a little bit deeper. But um, that's where I got out of Tate, right? He is the guy who overall ends up getting the 90 catches, around 1,000 yards, doesn't put up touchdowns, and has a lot of dud games. So we move over to Marvin Jones, and we'll compare the two now, right? Marvin Jones, like I said, overall 58, wide receiver 24. Jones really found his groove in 2017 after coming over to Detroit in 2016. Um, it took him a season to kind of adapt and become a really big part of this offense. He caught 61 of 107 targets last year for just over 1,100 yards and nine scores. This is following back-to-bike four touchdown seasons. Right, so it was low touchdown totals for Jones, but don't forget back in, uh, this was a while ago, back in 2013, he had that 10 touchdown season with the Cincinnati Bengals. So there are reasons to be both optimistic and to be cautious about Jones in 2018. Um, and this is a guy I can't really, you know, I, we'll just break it down before I get into the end. You know, I'm gonna lay down the big facts only. I'm gonna lay down big facts only here on Big Dogs Gotta Eat, because that's what we do, BFO and I'll let y'all decide. Jones was a beast last year, going off the stats that I just said, but other statistics and other efficiency metrics. He ranked number one in the NFL in yards per reception. He averaged 18, yes, 18 yards per reception last year, which ranked first in the NFL. He was first in the NFL in air yards. His nine touchdowns were tied for third most in the NFL. His 1,101 yards were ninth in the NFL. 
he ranked fifth in yards per target, 10.5 yards per target, and he finished as wide receiver nine overall in fantasy, but I don't want to be unfair because like we did with Tate, we want to look at points per game. He finished as wide receiver 11 on points per game. And I'm talking about in half PPR leagues. Now he's getting drafted as wide receiver 24. So a lot more room for ceiling and floor play there, considering he finished as wide receiver 11, getting drafted as wide receiver 24. Tate finished as wide receiver 19 points per game, getting drafted at wide receiver 22. Um, so you can see where there's a little discrepancy here. I'm a little hungry, guys, so I kind of want to get into some eggs right now. I'm kind of riding the keto diet still. Try to keep my carbs as low as Paul Cible. For all y'all that don't know, fun fact. Ugh. Fitness related, not fantasy related. Your body has three macronutrients. Well, uh, if you count alcohol, then four. I certainly count alcohol. I actually should almost do five. I should do alcohol and then tequila as a fifth, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about food, digestible things. Carbs, fats, proteins, right? Those are the three macronutrients that your body it intakes. However, you don't need carbs to live. You only need fat and protein. If you didn't eat another carb for the rest of your life, your body can produce energy and would be fine. So that's kind of why I think the keto diet works because rather than using the carbs, that if they don't get used, they, they end up getting stored as fat, your body starts using just the fat that you intake. If you're just eating fat and you're just eating protein, that's what keto is. You keep your carbs under like 25 grams or whatnot. I have no idea why I'm even getting into this. I forgot what I was saying. But since we're in the middle of this break, I want to thank our sponsors for today's video. That is fantasyjocks.com. They are the industry leader in fantasy sports leagues equipment. They actually won a uh, award last year for the Fantasy Sports Trade Association for the number one championship belt rings and trophies. So this bad boy, actually, they're sending me over a new customized belt. They're sending me over a package. They're sending me over um, a few things that are supposed to arrive next Thursday. So in one of the videos next week, I'll show you. I'll do like a little unboxing before my uh, before the before the video takes place. You can see they're sending me over a custom belt that says like E Town Get Down League. That's my big money league champion on the bottom, and it's getting all the champion, the past champions' names engraved on it. They're sending me over a new ring, a couple draft board kits, one for my E Town Get Down League, and then one for the uh, New York City live draft weekend subscribers only. Um, so that's going to be dope. So they got a good package coming out. I can't wait to see the belt. It's going to be sick. Um, anyways, yeah, they sell awesome championship belts, trophies, like big Lombardi trophies that you can also get the champion's names uh, inscribed on it, championship rings, all this good stuff, draft boards if you do a live draft with your friends. Um, yeah, dude, it's it just really, really, really high quality stuff. It makes playing in your league like so much funner and, and more enjoyable because you're playing for something other than just money and bragging rights. So I suggest get all your league mates, chip in eight bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, depending on whatever pieces of equipment you want to get and grab yourself some gear for your league. Don't you want to rock this bad boy? I actually feel like Stone Cold Steve Austin right now, like walking out in fucking WWF. You know, and he's like, oh man, I should have got some Budweiser's for this video. And he's like walking down the stage. I feel like he wears overalls all the time. Am I right on that? Or does Stone Cold Steve Austin not wear overalls? I feel like he did. Anyways, that's what I feel like with this belt on my shoulder. So, y'all want to feel like Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know where to go. FantasyJocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, for 10% off. That'll hit you guys up. Rather than throwing down $9 a person in your league, you'll throw down $7.42. Love that. So, FantasyJocks.com, thank you for sponsoring today's video. And let's get back into, what was I saying? Marvin, Marvin, Marvin. Shout out Marvin Jones, though, for that name. I feel like he's the last person born after, like, 1972 to have the name Marvin. My grandpa's name is Marvin. Great name, great people, great company. Thus is why you want Marvin Jones over Golden Tate. What the hell was I saying? So last year, we saw him develop into one of the elite deep threats in the NFL. Him and Stafford started getting a really, really good chemistry as the year was going on. They started off really, really slow, though. So I, I don't want you to forget this because there's recency bias in fantasy, right? You only look at what happened at, over the, the end of the season or the last half of the season where Marvin Jones started off really slow. He failed to top 55 receiving yards in any of the first five games in 2017. So a bunch of dud games. He did have two touchdowns in that span, but yardage-wise, he was not up there. Um, so he was not producing in this offense as much as you would like to see. He only saw over six targets once in those first five games. <sighs> one time, one time, man. Shout out, shout out Jamaicans. Shout out. If anyone saw, I got to stop going on tangents. This episode's are already got like six of them. Um, Luke Cage season two, pretty good. Shout out to Jamaicans. I thought the villain in, in season two was pristine. Liked it. Um, what the hell was I saying? But following their week five loss to Carolina, Jones, that's when Jones started becoming a bigger part of this 
offense and, and a bigger part of their game plan. He would go over 60 receiving yards and or score a touchdown in nine of their elast... Why did I just say elast? Elastic. He, he, Martin Jones is pretty elastic, actually, if you think about it. Kind of like a knockoff A.J. Green, who actually is starting to outproduce A.J. Green, ironically. But Marvin Jones, 60 receiving yards and or a touchdown in nine of their last 11 games, including six games with 15 fantasy points or more. So he was a stud for you if you had him on your team. And although Tate out-targeted him on the year, right? Uh, Jones saw, what do you see, 107 targets. Tate ended up with 120. So although he was out-targeted on the year, after those first five weeks, from week six on, Marvin Jones actually out-targeted Tate and averaged more targets per game than Tate did. And I'll get into the exact numbers a little bit later, but um, that's big because going back to the stat that I mentioned before from the PFF guy, Michael Moore, shout out, don't kill me, please. He's averaging 10 yards more per target. So before the catch, it's already a one point fantasy advantage. So if he can close that catch rate number, which was, you know, the discrepancy is a little big there because Tate obviously has shallower throws. So he catches a lot more balls than Marvin Jones. Um, if he can close that number and catch more balls, Marvin Jones is going to be so, so much more valuable than Golden Tate in fantasy. That's the good things for Marvin Jones. And there are a few more that I'll mention later, but here are the concerns for Jones, right? He was super efficient last year. Like I said, third in touchdowns among receivers, ninth in yards, despite being the 21st most targeted wide receiver. So he did a lot with not so much. Chasing efficiency in redraft leagues is not uh, a really good idea because it's very hard to nail efficiency, especially with touchdown totals that fluctuate. Chasing efficiency in redraft is... A bad idea, but chasing it in Dynasty is, is is something that you should do because efficiency usually plays itself out in the long run and efficiency turns into volume. But for redraft, it's hard to hit on that year over year. So um, similar to, you know, similar, similar to Alvin Kamara, who had an incredibly big year last year. His efficiency was so high, but the difference between him and Kamara is Kamara, you can actually project an increased volume um, in his workload, whereas you can't say that for Marvin Jones. Same thing with Tyreek Hill. Um, he was incredibly efficient last year, where now you can't project an increased workload. You might even have to project a decreased workload, seeing as how Sammy Watkins is coming in. So that's that's what I'm talking about. Why we, you shouldn't chase efficiency in fantasy football. You should look at the outside um, outside numbers to kind of tell you which direction to look at when you're looking at the outlook of a player. Anyways, um, I do expect jo Jones's volume to stay around the same. Um, because he saw 103 targets in 2016, 107 last year, so around the same number. While we saw Tate's targets drop off from 23% to 21% in terms of the target market share on Detroit year over year, Jones has stayed the same. So Tate's share is dropping, but Jones has stayed at 19% in both seasons. So we're not seeing him getting less involved in the offense. Um, and over those last 11 games, as I, as I mentioned, he was out targeting Tate. He was averaging 7.36 targets a game over the last 11. That's a big sample size, right? That's the only part of the season that's outside of that sample size is five games. So you would say that's more realistic than what the first five games were. That 7.36 targets a game averages out to or paces out to on a 16 game sample size 118 targets. So if he's going to see those targets, that's uh, that that's primo for 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 Jonesy. Um, and the other, you know, the big elephant in the room here, other than the the efficiency possibly going down, is the fact that God damn it, I don't know how I'm going to wear overalls for an entire party on Saturday. Um, that's neither here nor here. Is of course Kenny Galladay. He is the elephant in the room. Everybody loves Kenny Galladay. Everyone and their mothers loves Kenny Galladay. Everyone and their mothers, 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 farmers, owners, cattle groomer, tractor riding, his mother, along with Michael Moore, loves Kenny Galladay. Um, Kenny Galladay is the truth, man. If you've watched him play at all, he is a legit red zone threat. He's a legit outside receiver. Um, his contested catches are just like unbelievable. His hands are so strong. Huge target. I think he's like 6'4", 215. Kenny G smooth, man. Kenny G smooth. And uh, as much as I want to say they should start getting him more involved, nothing about last season other than him taking over TJ Jones's spot. He was not eating into Marvin Jones's workload. He was not eating, or not, I shouldn't say workload, but I mean snap percentage and, and time on the field. Like there wasn't a point where you started seeing Marvin Jones's numbers um, his playtime on the field kind of decreased while Kenny Galladay's is up. So it's hard to say that realistically outside of you loving his talent, which I do, that Kenny Galladay is, um, I, in my eyes, he's the wide receiver, he's the clear wide receiver three on this depth chart behind Tate and Jones right now. 
So I just I don't want I don't want people's range of projections to get out of control just because you love Galladay's talent because you don't know what's actually going to happen there. I would still say he's he's uh, he's certainly behind Jones and Tate, but here's the thing: I was looking at numbers. I wanted to look at splits when Galladay played um, versus when he did not. There were five games that Galladay did not play, um, and Jones's numbers, as you could see, took a pretty massive hit. In the 11 games where Galladay was on the field. Um, Marvin Jones only averaged 5.27 targets. On the five games that he was not on the field, that target total went up to 9.8 per game. You could see his receptions went up, his touchdown numbers went up, his receiving yards went up, all his fantasy points went up, which scares me. Um, and I mean, I'm sure the first five games of the season where Jones started off slow was kind of mixed into that skewed split a little bit, but the numbers kind of jump out of you a lot. And, and it does scare me a little bit. I do expect Galladay to completely have the wide receiver three role by himself, which is fine because he'll get plenty of play time. The, the Detroit Lions actually ranked fourth in the NFL last year in total plays uh, out of three wide receiver sets. So he, he will be on the field for probably all 16 games, barring injury, which that, again, makes me a little bit nervous about Jones. So um, that's the thing. And then when you look at Golden Tate's numbers here with uh, with Galladay on the field and without him, it's, it's pretty much identical. His targets are within a tenth of a target. Um, his touchdown numbers actually went up when when uh, Galladay was on the field. Um, his usage and everything else was pretty much the same. So you see Jones's numbers dip, Tate's numbers uh, stay relatively the same, unaffected. So as we always do here at Big Dogs Gotta Eat, we continue eating. We continue diving further because I give you the best breakdowns and analysis when we're in the muck, baby. I do it in overalls, I do it in t-shirts, I do it in Big Dogs Gotta Eat sweaters and hoodies if you're trying to support the brand you want to cop some apparel you could do that right now on bigdogsfantasy.com i would love you for that if you want to cop some apparel then send me a picture i'll post you on my instagram i'll post you on my twitter and whatnot and show the peoples what's up also on bigdogsfantasy.com right now is my 2018 draft guide a 135 plus page e-magazine that you get on your mobile on your on your tablet, on your laptop, that will prep you for your draft. I'm talking all my rankings, positional rankings by tiers, dynasty rookie rankings, my top sleepers, bust, must draft, resources that you will always be able to use. And it's interactive, there's videos, there's links to click on, shit that you'll be able to use way beyond the year of 2018. Um, so my draft guide is officially up for sale right now on my website. If you wanna go check it out, I will link it down below. It'll be the first link down there. Um, so I would appreciate any of the support that you guys give for that. Anyways, what was I saying? Something about still eating. Ugh, let me take another bite of my food, sorry. There are still other factors at play. Uh, one of them is the backfield. They bring in LeGarrette Blunt. They trade up in the second round to bring in Carrion Johnson, who I absolutely adore. Um, he was the former Offensive Player of the Year in the SEC coming out of Auburn. Carry on the God Johnson, man. He's going to come in, and I think he's going to make an immediate impact in the running game. Um, what we're seeing in Detroit is that they're trying to establish the run game more and more, and it makes sense given the offensive line that they've quietly put together. It'll be the best line that they've had definitely in Detroit um, in Stafford's tenure. Um, they, they drafted Frank Ragnow, the center from Arkansas, with their first round pick. Who This dude's a bully. This guy's a, an absolute animal, um, and, I, and he's really good in the run game. So I, I expect that to be a focal point of their offense. Um, and I was uh, I was surprised to see that they they ranked so highly in, um, in 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 Pro Football Focus. They just came out with a new article ranking the 2018 offensive lines going into the season, and Detroit was all the way up at number eight. I will say though, Stafford's been a top 10 quarterback in terms of pass attempts in every year since 2011, and has averaged the fourth most attempts during that span. So, you know, there's still a high volume passing offense, but I think the trend that we're seeing over the last couple of years and the way they're drafting and developing this line and, and investing in the backfield tells us where they really want to go. Um, so the interesting trend I wanted to find, the red zone and, and down there, right, in the 10 zone. So I looked at Marvin Jones, I looked at Golden and Tate, and I wanted to see their involvement down there. And what you're seeing here is year over year, 2016 and 2017, their targets in the 10 zone, so inside the, the opponent's 10 yard line and the red zone. Marvin Jones' numbers stay exactly the same. Golden Tate's numbers fall off pretty dramatically. He only had two 10 zone targets last year. He only had eight red zone targets last year after seeing 17 the year before. Uh, Marvin Jones, like I said, stayed exactly the same, identical. I wanted to see, was that a volume thing? Did the passing volume completely come down in the red zone? Or like what, what was the overall plays you know, that they ran in the red zone coming down? And that's why we saw the dip in volume there. Um, what I found though was from year over year, 
from 2016 to 2017, Stafford's red zone, red zone attempts, passing attempts, dropped by 11%. And his 10 zone attempts dropped by 14%. And uh, again, what I first thought was maybe overall, they just didn't have that many run, they didn't have that many plays overall in the red zone and the 10 zone. So that could be the reason why that was not the case. From the rushing side of things, their red zone carries increased 20% year over year. Their 10 zone carries increased by 23% year over year. The drop in passing volume in the red zone was due to the increase in rushing volume in the red zone. And now they're bringing in LeGarrette Blunt, uh, a very good red zone runner, as well as Carrion Johnson, who scored, I think, like 15 touchdowns last year. So you see what they're trying to do when they're in the red zone. So I expect them to keep making that a heavy part of their game, especially with Frank Ragnall coming in. Now, the good thing here for Jones, at least, is even with the dip in overall volume from the passing side of things, he saw the exact same number of targets year over year, which means he was still a big part of that game plan. And Stafford's not looking to force the ball to Tate in that area of the field. Now, Ebron is gone, which leaves 81 targets, 12 in the red zone, 7 in the 10 zone up for grabs. But I don't think much of that, if any, goes to Tate or Marvin Jones, considering Galladay is going to get a boost in playing time, as well as they brought in Luke Wilson as the tight end. Man, don't sleep on Luke Wilson. Don't sleep on him. I know he's a little bit older, but look at these numbers, man. Look at the, look at those 40-yard dash numbers. The spark score is 93rd percentile athlete. Speed score, he just never really got the chance. So I see uh, Wilson as a, as a late-round guy who, who could surprise us. Um, so, yeah, I don't see Ebron's targets really going to Tate or Marvin Jones, so I don't really want to talk too much further on that. An interesting tidbit I did find out that I tweeted out last week also, 2016 to 2017, when Marvin Jones came over, he has scored 13 touchdowns since he came to the Lions. Seven of 13, or 54% of them, have come from 22 yards or out. So a lot of deep touchdowns. Golden Tate has scored nine touchdowns in that span. Six of nine, nice. 67% have come from 23 yards out. Four of nine have come from 40 yards out, which is crazy considering the fact that he has so many games with low yards totals, but he is a threat to break a deep play at any point. You know what I mean? I just thought it was interesting. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure what it even means. Like this stat, you could take that for what it's worth. Other than both of the guys are kind of big play um, guys, and maybe Jones's involvement in the red zone, which is nice to see, isn't actually as important as we think because they both score touchdowns from pretty deep out anyways. Um, but what I will say about this improved offensive line, while it does cater to the run game more, I think this means that, one, when they're passing the ball, this gives, this means more, uh, more time in the pocket for Matt Stafford, which means more time for Marvin Jones to get down the field. The guy averaging 18 yards per reception now has more time to get down the field and break off his route. So I, while I think inversely it does work against the passing game because it'll probably see less volume and they'll probably try to run the ball more, I think it works well for a guy like Jones who needs kind of time to get down the field if he is the deep threat. You know what I mean? To wrap this up, right, to, to kind of get to the conclusion here because I'm not sure how long we've been talking for. I'm actually going to check right now. At the end of the day, I just really don't want Tate, to be honest with you. Unless I'm in a full PPR league, I'd probably be okay. I'd probably consider it, but I'm going to side with Marvin Jones, probably in all formats, to be honest with you. However, I will say I'm not reaching for Marvin Jones because of the concerns that I laid out in terms of Kenny Galladay, in terms of them being more focused on rushing the ball in the red zone. He's a guy that I would like on my team if I plan on going running back heavy early, right? If I go like running back, running back, tight end, running back, something like that, and you can get Marvin Jones in the fifth, sixth round as your wide receiver two or something, I would be completely fine with that given what we've seen his upside is, right? And going back to the points per game, as I was saying, wide receiver 11 last year, getting drafted 24. Tate, wide receiver 19, getting drafted as 22. A lot more room for Marvin Jones to hit his ceiling and hit his floor, in my opinion. So uh, I think he's just a much better value in terms of where they're going in drafts. Um, and there isn't really a good reason to assume that Tate builds on his numbers from last year. I think best case scenario is that he kind of matches those, his numbers that he's seen, 90, 1,005. Worst case scenario is kind of what I was playing on, that the line is better. They're going to rush the ball more, which means the overall pass attempts um, that Stafford has seen so high numbers of over the last few years come down. And Tate's a guy who relies on volume. He needs a ton of catches given that his yards per reception, his, his average depth of target is really, really low. He needs a lot of volume to hit good numbers. And if that passing game comes down at all, you're going to see Tate's numbers pretty affected pretty, pretty, pretty heavily. So um, at the end of the day, like I said, I like Jones a lot more where he's getting picked because I think his floor and his ceiling is baked into his ADP. And on the other hand, you look at Tate, 
Uh, I don't. I, I think his ceiling is just a little bit higher than when he's getting drafted. I don't think his floor is properly baked into his ADP. So at the end of the day, it's Jones for me, and that's my breakdown, breaking down this motherfucker and goddamn overall. That's gonna be it for today's video. Make sure you give this bad boy a thumbs up. I would really, 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 really appreciate that. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Every Monday we're going in the muck and comparing two players just like this. We're breaking it down, getting granular, getting in them shits, getting in the muck. And that's really it, guys. Any comments down below who you want to see next week or the week after that. Uh, you know, I always appreciate the support and the engagement. So thumbs up, subscribe if you're new. Leave a comment down below and I'll see y'all on Wednesday. Though I have to say goodbye, remember me.